In our last lecture, we discussed the Reformation in Germany under Martin Luther. And so today, we want to mostly discuss the Reformation as it happened beyond Germany. The theological ideas of the Reformation spread rapidly throughout Europe by the new media of printing, by academic discussion, but also by a real revival of street preaching. People were excited about these things, and they were taking it out and preaching the message everywhere that they could. Um, the theological foundations of the message that they preached can be expressed in the sola statements that the Reformers prized very highly, such as sola scriptura, sola Christus, sola gratia, and sola fides, which of course means the scriptures alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone. Now, it's important to understand that the Roman Catholic Church would agree with the importance of the Scriptures and with the importance of Christ and the importance of grace and faith. They simply would not attach the sola in front of each. In other words, if you were to ask a Roman Catholic, are the Scriptures important? Yes. Are they your only source of authority? No. If you were to ask them, um, does God's Revelation come to us in an authoritative way other than the Scriptures? They'd say yes, through the tradition of the Church. So, uh, salvation comes by Christ and by Mary and the saints. Salvation comes by grace and by the works of man. Grace is received by faith and by works. To each of these things, the Reformers protested and they insisted on the souls. For example, as Martin Luther said, he said, true faith lays a hold of Christ and leans on Him alone. Our opponents cannot understand this. In their blindness, they cast away the precious pearl, Christ, and hang on to their shabby works. Now, I find it very interesting that according to some people today, the Roman Catholic Church is now in agreement with some of the solas. Uh, towards the end of the last century, uh, the year 1999, uh, there was a joint declaration on justification or salvation by faith composed by Roman Catholics and Lutherans and signed by Pope John Paul II. It, it was promoted at the Lutheran World Federation on October 31st, 1999, of all days, on Reformation Sunday that they would do this. Anyway, this is what the statement says. In faith, we together hold the conviction that justification is the work of the triune God, the Father sent His Son into the world to save sinners. The foundation and presupposition of the justification is the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. Justification thus means that Christ Himself is our righteousness, which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. Together we confess, by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our heart while equipping and calling us to good works. Some people regard this as a substantial theological concession by the Roman Catholic Church. Some people say, no, the people who made the concession weren't high officials of the Roman Catholic Church, so it doesn't reflect a true change in their teaching. There's been an awful lot of dispute about this. But in light of this consensus, we have to consider that maybe, at some time in the future, the Roman Catholic Church may change. I doubt that it would on these specific things, but a, a statement just like this is encouraging. It doesn't settle the issue, but it's encouraging. There was another very important theological principle that I want to mention kind of apart from the solos, solas, connected to them, but apart from them. And that's the theological principle of the priesthood of all believers. In essence, the priesthood of all believers meant that every believer was his priest before God and did not need another mediator. It was the outworking of the principle of 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This means that the individual is empowered to have his own relationship with God. And he did not need another priest. He is his own priest. Now compared to the way that society had thought for generations, this was a real revolution in thinking. 
In some ways, this emphasis did more to change society than any other principle which came from the Reformation. Because there's a real sense in which the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer, through the way that it empowered the individual, it laid the foundation for modern democracy. I don't have any hesitation in telling you that I believe that if you were to select the most influential man on the earth over the last thousand years, I would say it would be Martin Luther. I think Martin Luther has done more to influence society and to affect the course of a civilization over the last thousand years than any other single individual. However, the Reformation, though in one sense it began with Martin Luther, it certainly did not end with him. And the Reformation spread beyond Germany in some very interesting ways. So therefore, we're going to take a look now, a very brief look, at the life of Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli lived from 1484 to 1531. Again, 1484 to 1531. Zwingli was a man who had a humanist education. Again, back then, that was a good thing. He was converted after he entered the ministry as a career. So he enters the ministry as a career, and then he gets converted. His reforms began to gain steam after he debated another bishop and beat him in the debate. Zwingli was really a co-reformer with Luther. He wasn't just a warmed-over Luther. It's very interesting to see how um, Ulrich Zwingli seemed to get his ideas independently of Martin Luther. They thought almost identically the same, yet he didn't seem to be influenced at the beginning from Luther. In the year 1519, Zwingli was called to become the people's priest at the great minster of Zurich. Now, Zwingli immediately began to preach straight through the books of the New Testament. He rejected the normal way of, uh, of teaching from just assigned texts that the church would give you, and he decided, I'm going to teach verse by verse through books of the New Testament. As his excited listeners heard his careful expositions of the Bible, they began to say, we've got to change the way the church is done, and we need to change it so it's done more like the Scriptures. Now again, this reform was independent of Martin Luther, although Zwingli was encouraged by what Luther had done. And so, the years 1519 to 1523 were years when Zwingli taught and reforms were gradually, gradually, I should say, introduced. Now, in October of 1523, Zwingli became reluctant to continue to celebrate the Mass because he couldn't find a scriptural foundation for it. So he took his concerns to the city council of Zurich. He said, hey guys, I look in my Bible and I don't find any foundation for the celebration of the Mass the way that we do it in the Roman Catholic Church. I don't find any um, uh, evidence for the way the transubstantiation, I don't find any evidence for the way that the Mass is supposedly a continual reenactment of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. I, I just don't buy it. I'm not so into the Mass anymore. Well, the city council said, Zwingli, don't change anything. We don't want you to change the Mass or get rid of it. They said, Zwingli, we believe you're correct in your theology, but we think it's too soon to make these changes. In December, Zwingli informed the council again that he intended to change the liturgy of the Mass, but again the council refused, and Zwingli backed down. He said that the speed of reformation was in the hands of the state, not in the hands of pastors such as himself. So you get the idea here. Zwingli's saying, hey, I think we need to change things. He talks to the city council about it, and the city council says, no, you're not going to change it. And Zwingli says, okay, we won't change it. He rationalized this because he figured that nothing could be done without these um, officials of state approving it. Um, this is a very difficult concept for you to get a hold of because it's so foreign to you. But very much in the consciousness of medieval Europe at that time, and in this early days of the Reformation, it was just the same. They could not help but see 
church and state as being totally intertwined. Church and state were supposed to work together to make a Christian society. That's just the way that they see it, that they saw it. It became, it became clear that despite the fact that Zwingli had the right biblical ideas, he couldn't conceive of any other arrangement other than church and state working together to make a Christian society. Now, I don't blame Zwingli particularly for that, because very few people in his day could see it either. But therefore, he felt, let's not go forward with these reforms. Now, since... Zwingli and Luther developed their reformations along similar lines, but sort of out of different impulses. It made sense that they would get together and discuss their theologies. Let's get together and see if we agree, see how close we are. And so they got together in October of 1529 in a place called Marburg. They had a private meeting at Marburg. Where they came together, Marburg is a German city, not very far from where we live in Ziegen. And they got together at this German city called Marburg in 1529. And, and they said, okay, listen, um, let's start going through our doctrines one by one. Um, they start talking about the gospel. They start talking about their view of the scriptures. They start talking about their view of Jesus. They start talking about their view of um, you know, the church. They start talking about their view of all these different things. And they seem to be in amazing agreement. Agreement, 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 agreement. It's a very exciting thing. Zwingli, the leader of the Swiss Reformation, Luther, the leader of the German Reformation, they seem to be meshing together perfectly. Then, if Z when Zwingli asked if it was okay for a Christian to ask how Christ could be present in the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. When Zwingli questioned transubstantiation, Luther replied, What are you talking about? Are you trying to say that, that the bread and the wine are just, sim are just symbols? Certainly, certainly, Luther said, Jesus Christ is present in the bread and in the wine. Now, it's very important to say, Martin Luther did not believe in transubstantiation. He believed in what's called consubstantiation, which doesn't say that the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ, but that the bread and the wine stay bread and stay wine, but Christ is spiritually with the bread and the wine. Consubstantiation is not transubstantiation, but it's not very far from it. And they started in a huge argument over the nature of the bread and the wine in, com in communion. Luther became furious. He started yelling at Zwingli. He started saying things like, listen, Jesus said that we're to eat his body, and if he told me to eat crab apples and manure, I'd eat it because it was a command. Luther got so angry that he said that Zwingli was of another spirit in the midst of this whole argument. That kind of shows you the kind of fiery guy that Martin Luther was. He, he just couldn't back down from an argument. And so they ended in a disaster, right? This, this, this meeting that could have been a great example of unity, a great example of fellowship, it turned out with a lot of sour feelings because they disagreed over one issue, the nature of the bread and the wine in communion. It's too bad. Um, there was no agreement when they left. Tragically, Zwingli was killed in battle against Roman Catholic armies. He served as a chaplain in the Protestant militia, and he was killed in battle at Capitol. Now, we want to take a very brief look at the life of John Calvin. The important thing to remember about John Calvin at the very beginning is that he was a second-generation reformer. He was not of the same generation as Luther and Zwingli. He was a second generation of them. Uh, he was born in 1509 and he died in 1564. You could say that Calvin was a Lutheran. Or you could say that Luther was a Calvinist. You could say that Luther argued for the doctrines of predestination and election even more than Calvin did. 
Calvin's interest in these matters was more pastoral. Luther's was more of a matter of theological debate. Now, John Calvin was not exactly an original thinker, but he was a great organizer and a very good writer. He was also a very devoted pastor over his church in um, Geneva. By the way, at his church in Geneva, Calvin would every day get up and teach a morning Bible study, verse by verse, going through books of the Bible. Calvin's commentaries are basically transcripts of these Bible studies that he would give. I just want you to notice something. Luther taught the Bible, verse by verse, to his people. Zwingli taught the Bible, verse by verse, to his people. Calvin taught the Bible, verse by verse, to his people. Hus taught the Bible, verse by verse, to his people. This is very important to understand. These were not just men preaching sermons. They were men who were concerned that their people have a real verse-by-verse -verse biblical education. John Calvin was born the second of five sons, and his father worked for the Bishop of Neuss in France, which was his birthplace. Through his father's birth, uh, influence, he was appointed to two ecclesiastical offices, and then he drew the income from them which, much the same as Wycliffe, several centuries before, it basically funded his education. He went to university, he studied some theology, and in the beginning, it looked like he might become a priest, but then he studied law more. We really don't know the details of John Calvin's conversion, but at the university, both in Paris and Orleans, he had many Protestant friends and associates, and it seemed that their influence upon him eventually brought him around to Protestant ideas and to the understanding of the gospel. Because he was such a young man with such a good intellectual head on his shoulders, he soon became one of the leaders of Protestantism in Paris. Now, Calvin was very outspoken in his leadership of the Protestant movement in Paris, and he gave many strong calls for the reformation of the Roman Catholic Church in France along the lines as what had happened in Luther's Germany. I mean, you can just see a young man like that going around. Hey, what happened in Germany? We need it to happen here in France. Uh, he caused a very strong reaction against himself, and it ended up that he had to flee Paris for his own safety. He also resigned his ecclesiastical offices in Neuss. This illustrates the idea that Calvin really wasn't like a lion, the way that, excuse me, the way that Luther was. It wasn't that Calvin was a coward. I think it would be wrong to call him that. But he didn't seem to enjoy conflict the way that Luther did. Calvin was pretty much a bookish man who pretty much wanted to be left alone with his books to pursue his scholarly ambitions in his writings. As he had to move from place to place to avoid persecution, he continued writing. In 1536, when he was only 27 years old, he published his first edition of Calvin's Institutes. This, especially in its future editions, would be Calvin's great work and it showed his ability to explain and organize doctrine. Again, I want to emphasize, Calvin was not a groundbreaker, but what he did was he organized and explained things very well. He was forced to be on the run because of persecution, and his forced travels brought him to Strasbourg and then to Geneva, where he intended to stay for only one night. Now, the Reformation work in Geneva was led by a fiery man named Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, when he heard that the famous teacher and writer John Calvin was spending the night in a city, he went to go see him. Pharaoh demanded that Calvin stay in Geneva and take leadership of the Protestant cause of the city. Calvin refused. He didn't want to do that. So Pharaoh threatened the curse of God upon him if he didn't do it. With great fear, Calvin agreed to stay in Geneva. He only attended to stay there. Uh, Pharaoh had this emblem, the sword of the true word, a flaming sword. He, he was sort of a fiery guy, and that he persuaded Calvin to stay. Now at first, it didn't go very well in Geneva. Farrell and Calvin worked together to transform the city after a godly Protestant ideal, but they were very strongly opposed and were basically run out of town. Geneva was officially a Protestant city, but it was not a godly or an ordered place, 
and it had a reputation around Europe for immorality. So Calvin went back to Strasbourg. Now he might have stayed there, but he was drawn back to Geneva because the Roman Catholic Church launched a campaign to stamp out Protestant belief from Geneva. And Calvin felt a duty to defend the city and to strengthen the Protestant cause there. So basically, Calvin returned to Geneva, and through hard work, strong arguments, and lots of political and police pressure, he transformed the city from having a reputation for immorality to having a reputation for godliness. Geneva then became a magnet for Protestants from all over Europe who came and were influenced and went back to their native lands. This was especially true for English Protestants who were escaping persecution under Bloody Mary and other people. They would come find refuge in Geneva, and then when they were allowed to go back to England, they would come just enchanted by what they saw in Geneva and trying to spread those ideas there. Now, Calvin had to use a lot of strong leadership to transform the city. But this strong leadership also created a lot of controversy and opposition. He was accused of being a dictator. And it's partially true. But, but it's wrong to think that Calvin ruled Geneva like a king. He had a tremendous influence, and he used that influence to persuade the governmental leaders of the city, and it usually succeeded. For example, Calvin could not only put pressure and persuasion upon the um, civic leaders of Geneva, but he could also shun and refuse communion to those who were believed to be ungodly. There's a very famous case where Calvin very publicly refused communion to a group of people that he called libertines. That They took ungodly liberty in their Christian life. And then another example among several is the case of Michael Servetus, who was an infamous anti-Trinitarian teacher and troublemaker. You see, meaning to flee to Italy, Servetus stopped at Geneva, where Calvin and his reformers denounced him. On August 13, 1553, he attended a sermon by Calvin in Geneva. He was immediately recognized and arrested after service. At his trial, Michael Servetus was condemned on two counts for spreading and preaching anti-Trinitarian and anti-infant baptism teachings. Now listen, he believed in heretical things about the Trinity and he didn't agree with infant baptism. And so he was burned at the stake in October at a place right outside of Geneva. Calvin supported Servetus being executed although he did remain open to the idea that Servetus could be spared death if he converted. In this, he was within the mainstream of 16th century Christian theologians. A, a guy like Servetus was considered to be a dangerous heretic and a troublemaker by both Protestants and Roman Catholics. You see, I want you to get this idea that we talked about before, right? In these days, people really thought that the worst thing you could do was be a heretic. And if it's right, to execute somebody for murdering the body of somebody, how much more right is it to execute a heretic who goes out and murders the souls of people and sends them to hell? We would not agree with this at all, but this was the thinking in that day. You see, on the whole, the Servetus affair shows that Geneva was only heaven on earth for those who agreed with John Calvin. If you agreed with him, Geneva was like the best place on earth. If you didn't agree with him, it could be a very troublous place. The trial and execution of Servetus showed that consistent with most other people at his time, Calvin thought it was sometimes necessary to execute people, to kill them for their ideas and their words. One more aspect of the work of John Calvin should not be ignored. He was a devoted and gifted Bible teacher, a verse-by-verse -verse expositor of the Word. As I said before, for years, every morning, he would have a morning Bible study at his church in Geneva. He was a man very committed to the verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Bible. Now, what happened after Luther? What was the legacy of the Reformation? Well, the big question was, who would succeed Martin Luther? Philip Melanchthon seemed to be a natural choice. 
But many people mistrusted him and saw him as somebody who would betray Luther's ideals. You see, Melanchthon had retreated from Luther's very strong position on the human role and will and salvation. Uh, I'm going to exaggerate this a lot, okay? But, but just so you get the point out of exaggeration. Melanchthon was much more Arminian in his theology than Martin Luther was. It would be wrong to call Melanchthon an Arminian, but he was more that way than Luther was. But Melanchthon also ended up objecting to Luther's idea of the real presence of Christ and the elements of the communion, to the point where he was mocked as being a crypto-Calvinist, because this was one area where the Calvinists and the Lutherans disagreed strongly. The debate over Luther's succession became so heated at one stage that Lutheran university professors began taking guns into their lecture halls for self-protection. And they, you know, they were merciless to one another. This is sort of the idea of Philip Melanchthon covered with lice, he's filthy, he's unclean. At 1557, at the Colloquy of Worms, Lutherans were embarrassed before Roman Catholics because of their internal disagreements. The Protestants were beginning to fight amongst themselves more than they were to fight against the Roman Catholics, and it really started giving evidence to the Roman Catholic claim that things would get crazy once you left the authority of the Pope. Well, in 1577, they reached a general resolution with the formula of Concord creating a precise Lutheran orthodoxy. Now, one other thing that happened is sort of a reaction to this. As the generations after Luther and Melanchthon went on, there developed a reaction against the emphasis in the Lutheran circles at that time upon theology and not real personal experience. And this explained the rise of the Pietists. The Pietists were a group within Lutheranism that stressed the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not merely church membership through baptism. This was led by a man named Philip Jacob Spener, S-P-E-N-E-R. He lived from 1635 to 1705. Spener thought that it was better to be a Calvinist, or maybe even a Roman Catholic, and have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, than it was to be a Lutheran with a dead faith, but to have all the right doctrine. The Pietists stressed the importance of Bible study and small group fellowships. The movement became essentially a church within a church, which ended up being a common thing throughout Protestant and Roman Catholic history. So that was sort of the general course of Lutheranism after Luther. The general course of Calvinism after Calvinism is somewhat more interesting. A challenge to Calvinism arose from a man named Jacob Hermazum, who took the Latin name Arminius. He lived from 1560 to 1609. Now again, I want you to take a look at these dates, right? This is several decades after Luther's initial Reformation. These are trying to advance and trying to think about and trying to advance the ideas of the Reformation long afterwards. Arminius studied at Geneva under Theodore Beza, who was Calvin's successor. And he was ordained a Calvinist pastor at Amsterdam in 1588. In 1589, Arminius was called upon to defend the Calvinist doctrine of predestination in a debate. And so he started doing his research. And in weighing the rival arguments between Calvinism and those who objected to Calvinism, Arminius found himself siding with his opponent against the Calvinistic idea of predestination. In the 1590s, Arminius lectured on Romans and questioned the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 7 and Romans 9. And for such things as this, his orthodoxy was suspected and controversy surrounded him until his death in the year 1609. You see, Arminius believed that God's grace made salvation possible, but not inevitable. He said that the ultimate choice is not made by God, but by man. 
And God's election and predestination are based upon His foreknowledge of our choice for Him or our choice against Him. Now, after the death of Arminius, some of his followers composed five points of the Remonstrance. These were the five points of Arminianism. Now, this is what you need to understand. Maybe some of you in this room have heard of the five points of Calvinism. The five points of Calvinism came as a response to the five points of Arminianism. And the five points of Arminianism were not even set forth by Arminius himself, but by his followers after his death. And so these five points are this. Number one, man cannot be saved or choose Christ without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Number two, God's choice of certain individuals to salvation is based on His foreseeing of their response to His call. Number three, the work of Jesus on the cross made it impossible, made it to me, made it possible for all men to be saved, but it did not actually save anyone. That work must be coupled with the faith of the individual to work for salvation. The cross is only effective if a person chooses to accept it. Number four, the Holy Spirit cannot regenerate us until we believe, and the work of His regeneration can be resisted by the individual. Number five, for those who believe and are saved, it may be possible that they can lose their salvation by failing to keep up their faith. Now this was not the original order of the Remonstrance, uh, but again, it sort of matches up with the later order of the five points of Calvinism as they were presented. This teaching of the followers of Arminius started quite a dispute among Dutch Calvinists. The sides were also associated with rival political factions, and so it became very ugly very fast. For a while, it seemed like a civil war would break out in Holland over these doctrines. The Synod of Dort, that's 1618 to 19, was called by the anti-Arminians to settle the issue and they responded with five points of their own. Their five points basically center on these ideas. Total depravity or total inability, some people call it. Unconditional election, number two. Number three, limited, or some people say particular atonement. Number four, irresistible grace. And number five, the perseverance of the saints. And so this is where this great debate and battle between Calvinism and Arminianism began, not long after the death of Arminius and within a hundred years of the Reformation starting. These two doctrinal systems have combated back and forth through the centuries. Now, another big change in Calvinism after Calvin was that its center moved from Geneva to England. And then you could say Calvinism center later moved from England to the new American colonies. You see, this happened when Englishmen fled persecution under Roman Catholic monarchs and found <coughs> refuge in Geneva, and then later on they carried their Calvinism back to England where a sympathetic, or when a sympathetic monarch was ruled. So that's the general course of Calvinism in the few generations after the Reformation. Now we want to conclude our time here this afternoon by talking about the emergence of the Anglican Church or the Reformation in England. This is a complicated thing that follows very different lines. Okay? Reformation in Germany? Alright, I got it. You got uh, Martin Luther and his teaching spread to Holland and to Scandinavia. A reformation in Switzerland, okay, I got it. Starts with Zwingli, later on the torch is really carried by Calvin in Geneva, and that has a real influence on England, and then later on Holland, okay, I got it. I understand the connection. The reformation in England, much, much more complicated. The England church remained in union with Rome until the reign of Henry VIII who was king of England during Luther's Reformation work in Germany. Now the first break with Rome came uh, when Pope Clement VII refused over a period of years to annul Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, not purely as a matter of principle, but also because the Pope lived in fear of Catherine's nephew, who was Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, as a result of the um, events of the Italian Wars.
So, uh, Henry wanted to divorce his wife, the Pope wouldn't allow it, and so this caused problems for Henry. Why did he want to do it? Well, because he wanted a son to be the next Tudor king. His wife, Catherine of Aragon, had given him a daughter, but no son, and the Pope refused to let him get divorced. But then also, Henry was bankrupt from fighting wars, and he wanted to control the church because it was a big part of English life. Now again, part of this is just the same battle between kings and popes that we've seen throughout the centuries regarding the Roman Catholic Church in this Christian Empire period. So Henry first asked for an annulment in the year 1527. After various failed initiatives, he stepped up the pressure on Rome, and in the summer of 1529, by compiling a manuscript from ancient sources proving in law that spiritual supremacy rested with the monarch and demonstrating the illegality of the, papes, of the Pope's authority. Again, the same arguments that had been made in this conflict between popes and kings for many centuries. So, Henry challenged the Pope, they challenged back and forth many times, the, the Church of England refused to surrender its uh, lands, its money, its priests to the Church of Rome, and then finally, uh, the, the, they allowed Thomas Cranmer, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, because he was the new church of an English church. It wasn't the Roman Catholic Church in England any longer. Now it was the Anglican, or the English church. And the new head of the Anglican church was Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he issued Henry's annulment, and upon them Henry married Anne Boleyn. Pope Clement VII excommuted Henry VIII in 1533. Now, um, Henry was excited, not only because he got a new wife who might bear him a son, but he was also excited because now the church lands, the church monies, the church resources that once belonged to Rome now belong to England and the King of England. And so therefore, over a series of years, he did different things. In 1532 and 33, all payments to the Pope from the English church were stopped. In 1534, Henry became the head of the English church rather than the Pope. In 1536, Henry closed down the little monasteries. In 1538, Henry had a son, Edward. He decided that his teachers would be two famous Protestants. This was a very important decision. And then in 1539, an act was passed in Parliament, which meant that Catholic beliefs and church services were to be followed. It said that Protestants, excuse me, it said that, that um, it says that Protestants should be, no, that's surely wrong. That has to be reversed. Um, because in 1539, there was not an act passed in Parliament which said that Catholic beliefs in church services were to be followed. That's erroneous, that particular slide. I, I can correct that. Because in 1539, things were still very much firmly within the Protestant camp within England. If anything, Catholics would have been persecuted during that time, not Protestants. Now, despite their separation from Rome, the Church of England under Henry VIII remained essentially Catholic rather than Protestant in nature. In other words, Henry didn't want to change the character of the Roman Church. He just wanted it to be an English Roman Church, right? He, he wasn't concerned about the ceremonies. He had no theological objections with Catholic Christianity. As a matter of fact, he wrote a defense, or excuse me, not a defense, a defense of Roman Catholicism against Martin Luther. He fancied himself quite a little theologian and wrote a church, uh, wrote a tract defending the Roman Catholic Church against Martin Luther. For that, the Pope, this was many years before their split, for that the Pope gave Henry VIII the title Defender of the Faith. And that's a title that English monarchs hold to this very day. Now, this idea, Henry wasn't concerned with breaking with the Roman Catholic Church except politically and economically. Spiritually, he didn't mind the connection at all. And so there was a time of brief reunion with Rome. Now before that, Henry's son, Edward VI, he reigned only a few years and he did the first major changes advancing the church along more Protestant lines. But following the death of Edward, the Roman Catholic Mary, 
who reigned from 1553 to 1558, came to the throne. She renounced the changes that were made in the church by Henry and Edward, and she wanted to bring the church in England back to Rome. So again, um, in Henry VIII had everybody who refused him to accept him as the head of the Church of England executed for treason. And they were they had monks you know, killed and murdered because of that. But then later on, people were persecuted under Mary for quite opposite reasons, for remaining strong to their Protestant beliefs. She gained the common name of Bloody Mary because of her very widespread torture and execution of those who were... Um, uh, opposed to Roman Catholicism. And again, uh, you know, for a man named Cuthbert Simmons, he was tortured on the rack, and they told him, all you have to do is become a Catholic for the pain to stop. And in the previous picture, he saw a man being burned at the stake, probably at Smithfield. And then this was just a common thing, the torture that, that people would say. Um, th this is one famous thing where Ridley and Scott were... Um, executed by burning, and he said, We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. It was a very, very bad time to be a Protestant in um, England. Now, upon Mary's death in 1558, her half-sister Elizabeth came to the throne. This is the famous Queen Elizabeth. And she came to power and she was determined to keep the English church separate from Rome and to advance it more along Protestant lines. But this is the problem that they did. They felt they had to satisfy both Protestants and Catholics in the um, Anglican church. So how did they do this? Well, they basically adopted a strategy that said, we will keep basic Roman Catholic doctrine and Roman Catholic, excuse me, i got to take that back. We will keep basic Roman Catholic custom, but not Roman Catholic doctrine. Protestant doctrine, Roman Catholic custom. And to this day, the Anglican Church is a strange mixture of Catholic and Protestant. Uh, some years ago, we went to the, some months ago, I should say, we went to a service in um, Westminster Abbey, there in London. I had some of the interns from our Bible college, we were spending a few days in London, just to show them around and let them see some of the sights. And when we were there in London, we wanted to see Westminster Abbey. Well, when we got up to the uh, uh, door, we saw that it was like 10 pounds, the entry fee to get in, which is like $20. I thought, man, that's too much to walk around. But they said, well, we have a service starting at 5 o'clock. If you come back at 5 o'clock, you can come into the service for free. Okay, great. So we went in at 5 o'clock, got to look around Westminster Abbey, but we also got to sit in for the service. You would have thought that you were in a Roman Catholic church. It was an Anglican high church service. And it was very reminiscent of Catholicism. The robes, the incense, the choirs, the whole atmosphere felt very Roman Catholic. And so in a Roman Catholic church, you know, you have the altar, you have the decorations, you have different statues and such. Well, you'll find very similar things in high church people among um, uh, the Anglicans. The cathedrals, the robes, the vestments, whereas a Protestant church is very different. A Protestant church is structured to be centered around the pulpit. That's the most important place in the Protestant church. It's the pulpit. And they have an altar for serving communion. But again, the prominent place is the pulpit. And if the priest wears robes, they're not the same ornate robes that they would wear in the Roman Catholic tradition. And so they would just dress more simply and according to the traditions of hundreds of years ago, which they should do away with anyway. But nevertheless, they keep on it. Now, since this, the Roman, excuse me, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, has often had a hard time making up its mind. Are we a Roman Catholic Church, or are we a Protestant Church? Are we liberal, or are we evangelical? Some people decided to stay in the, in the um, Church of England, in the Anglican Church, and make it more Protestant. 
Those were people called Puritans. Other people left the Anglican Church because they said, it's too Catholic for us, we can't stand it. These people were known as separatists or nonconformists. And these, for example, were the pilgrims that first came to America. So Puritans were those who were loyal to the Anglican Church, but they wanted it to be more pure, more Protestant. Nonconformists, separatists, or pilgrims were those who just rejected the Anglican Church, believing that it was too corrupt. And there's been this tension in the, in the um, Anglican Church to this day. To this day, the Anglican Church has a high church party, which is interested in being more and more like Rome, and a low church party, which is interested in being more and more evangelical and Bible-believing. So these are dividing lines in the messy situation known as the Anglican Church. Let me give you this one last picture here. From left to right, you got a whole collection of uh, Reformation guys. Bucer, Bus, Melanchthon, on Prague, Luther, Calvin, Debeza, Wycliffe, on and on and on. If you notice, they're all around a candle and they're all around 